I think that means it's probably over to us. So <laughs> thank you very much, Carl. Um, we are going to introduce ourselves in a minute. I'm just going to hide all the speakers so that I'm not distracted by a bunch of faces down the side of my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, giving us this opportunity to share our work. Um, Martina and I have actually been trying to make this a paper now for the better part of four years. And um, we've had some very kind um, audiences at LCT UK and in South Africa, and then also in the Nordic um, LCT group who've given us some useful feedback. And we're hoping for more of that today because it's finally becoming a paper. So we're hoping that um, uh, for those people like Stephen and Vera and Rieta and Co who've heard a version of this before, you'll hear something different. <laughs> So um, our plan for the next 45 minutes is that we're going to introduce ourselves because that's part of the paper. And we're going to talk a bit about why we undertook up this project in the first place. And then we're going to situate our own experiences of doing a PhD and becoming doctors in the context of studies about doctoral education. And then we'll focus specifically on the project itself on LCT and the part of semantics that we're using, which is cosmologies and constellations. And then we'll show you some of our data, because we only have some, and what we think our analysis means so far for doctoral education and supervision practices. And like Carl said, if you need to ask a clarification question, or if we're talking too fast, or please just slow us down or ask us a question. Or anything, okay. anything. Or anything. Anything. Like or, I have a know. tiny, tiny nitpicking thing. Yeah. Which is cosmologists is an inside semantics, it's separate. It's outside the model. Well, you see, there you go. <laughs> That's the kind of feedback we need. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. It's, it sits outside <laughs> the dimensions, uh, cosmologists does. Right. But I, so we're I have using to say, constellations, maybe. I've then. not really made that clear because I introduced it in the context of semantics and I've never made it clear that it is a constellations oh. as a method and cosmologists is all the codes, so there you go. Okay, all right, well, that's very useful. Martina, are you making notes? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm Sharon. I got my PhD in 2014, and I started supervising my first student, and my first PhD student in 2015, and this was Martina. And this is quite, I should say that this is probably quite unusual. Um, usually you have to have held a PhD in, in some, well, certainly at the university I work at, you can't start supervising somebody straight after your PhD, especially not as a primary supervisor. But the university that Martina was doing her PhD at didn't have anybody who wanted to be or could be her primary supervisor. And we'd met the year before I left the university for Rhodes. And because I had a co-supervisor who was more experienced, they let me do it. But it was um, <laughs> it was quite an experience, I will say, because from the whole first year after crossing the stage and graduating almost to the day, I, I really was hugely uncomfortable with being called Dr. Clarence. Every time somebody said Dr. Clarence, I almost wanted to look over my shoulder and see who they were talking to. And I, I, I sort of actively went around saying, no, 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 just call me Sharon, just call me Sharon, it's fine. Um, and I don't think that that was necessarily because of something um, about me as a person. On reflection, I think, especially Martina and I's ongoing conversations around this project, I think it was really more that it was the shift from becoming a doctoral knower to having to be a doctoral knower or a graduated doctoral knower. And in, to, I kind of felt this implied to me that now I was completely capable of being an independent researcher. I was completely capable of writing papers for publication. I was completely capable of knowing the answer to bunches of questions that I didn't know the answers to. I was very confident, had lots of self-esteem. I was ready to be a leader rather than a follower. And it really just felt like too much in many ways. Um, some parts of it I felt quite confident about and other parts of it I really didn't feel confident about at all, like writing papers for publication from my thesis. So that started my process of asking questions around issues of identity and being and becoming and these expectations, like where do they come from? Why was it that I felt like I suddenly had to know things when literally three months before that, while I was still finishing my thesis, nobody expected me to know all these things. 
Um, I suddenly went from not being asked to do reviews for journals to getting a request every month to do a review for a journal. And there was a part of me that thought, I'm not a different person. I'm the same person I was. And now I just have this DR in front of my name. And suddenly people expect me to be able to do all these new things and be all these new things. And I don't know that I'm ready to do that. And, and then we started wondering together, and certainly I've wondered this a lot over the last couple of years, you know, how do you help students to take on this doctoral identity, whatever that is, and that's part of what the project's about um, in general. But then what about students who are not necessarily what higher education might consider a traditional student? So international students, students who don't speak, read and write, think in English, students who are women, students who are queer, students who are disabled, um, you know, students who have all sorts of other kinds of things in their backgrounds, like, do they just take on this identity? Do they also struggle? Is imposter syndrome, as they call it, just this individual thing? Or is there something about this environment that we're creating that leads to this? Um, and of course, Paul Martina had to, had to be my student during some of this identity crisis as well. And that certainly added to it because now I was responsible for this other person and their PhD journey, or at least a big part of it. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Martina and she can tell you her side of that story. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. Um, so as Sharon said, I started my PhD in 2015 and then I graduated in April, 2018. And although I had a really lovely supervision experience and I really enjoyed my topic and I still do, um, by the time I graduated, I felt a bit like an imposter. Uh, I felt like I wasn't really allowed to be called doctor because nothing I felt had changed intrinsically. I still felt like the same person, but now I had this title with all its expectations and connotations that I had to live up to. I only really started feeling like doctor when I started a new project or new research project with another colleague of mine who wasn't part of my PhD, where I drew up the proposal and I did the ethical clearance application and I drafted the questionnaire and all of that. And then I had this moment of like, oh, I know what I'm doing. And this made me feel like I was allowed to be called doctor. So whereas before I would let it slide if student called me miss or missus, I would now go doctor. Uh, which they didn't always like, but that's fine. Um, I still have <laughs> days where I giggle because I'm doctor and that's just insane, like we decided that. But I feel more confident in claiming that title and that identity. And this is largely because during my supervision and after my supervision, like my post thesis supervision, I still ask questions to Sharon all the time. Uh, I had lots and lots and lots and lots of conversations with both of my supervisors, but Sharon especially, about what it means to be doctor. Now, if I hadn't had those conversations and if I hadn't known that I'm not the only one who feels a bit impostery, then it would have made that journey a lot more difficult and it would probably have taken a lot longer to get to that point. So in starting this paper way, way back when in the coffee shop in the before times, um, we realized that what we have been talking about and reflecting on is the affective and axiological aspects of doing a doctorate which are less overtly discussed, problematized, and taught than the epistemological and methodological aspects of doing a doctorate. Okay, so before we look at what the field is saying, we want to acknowledge that there are different paths to a doctorate, which may therefore have different implications for identity development. However, in this paper, we are focused on doctoral students who want to remain in academia in some way, whether this is where they end up or not. Um, this is their intention and what therefore shapes the kinds of studies that they choose to do, the supervision they're offered and the help they receive with writing and publishing and so on. Moreover, the stakes may also be slightly different in academia than in industry around the PhD. It is increasingly difficult to get and keep and progress in academic roles without PhDs. Um, and this may not exactly be the same in industry with professional doctorates. Um, there are also implications around becoming supervisors and academic leaders that impact on the process of becoming on the ex uh, and on the expectations of being after the doctorate. 
So <clears throat> having had these conversations, we then turn to the literatures to see how our experiences and questions are being researched and thought about there. And some of you may know that I myself am part of the um, great literature space because I write a blog on becoming and being a, um, a scholar um, at this level. And there's a lot uh, out there in the blogosphere and in the, I think what they call the great literatures, but we decided really to focus on peer reviewed papers because there was just way too much if we didn't narrow it down. So, um, what we were wanting to read about in the peer reviewed research was the kinds of affective axiological attributes or dispositions of doctoral students that supervisors, especially, but not only, value and expect their students to evidence in supervision, in writing, in the engagement with their doctoral and research community, and also in the actual process of designing and doing the research and creating the dissertation. And then in some cases, especially um, in contexts that have a viva voce, in defending the thesis um, once it's completed and has been examined. So we're reading quite a lot, as you can imagine. If anybody knows anything about this field, it is quite a big field and there's lots and lots of research. What's interesting about it is that a lot of that research comes from what we call the global north, um, New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom. Um, there's a fair bit of research that's been done in Australia and Canada. Um, sorry, Canada and America as well. I said Australia. Um, and there's less research. There is not no research, but there's less research that comes out of South America, Africa. Um, and we're not obviously looking at studies that have been published in any language other than English, because that's the language that we are confident reading and writing in. So what we're finding as we read is that there are both explicit and implicit mentions of the valued and also undesirable dispositions and attributes of successful and unsuccessful PhD students. And what we're finding really interesting is how the affective aspects are situated in these studies. So in a study where the, um, and this is a general trend, there are obviously exceptions, but this is a general trend. In studies where the explicit focus of the paper is like how to successfully write a PhD or how to successfully um, deal with hard feedback or how to successfully um, do a particular kind of research. So what we would then think of maybe in terms of um, <clears throat> LCT is the more knowledge stuff or the more epistemological stuff. Um, there's definitely affective stuff happening there, but it's implied and between the lines more often than explicitly named, defined and explained. So if you take Margaret Kiley and Gina Whisker's works, they've done a lot of work on um, adapting um, mayor and land's threshold concepts um, and looking at the PhD journey and what kinds of thresholds PhD students have to cross in order to achieve what Trafford and Lesham originally called doctorateness. So um, not just being able to write a thesis, but being able to become a different kind of scholar through that process. And they have found through interviews with supervisors and through looking at students' work and talking to students as well, that you have to cross thresholds around working with theory, around um, claiming um, space in the field, around making an argument, around um, writing a literature review, which also has to do with claiming a space in the field. So that's lots of epistemological stuff. How do you incorporate theory into your work? That's a big threshold students have to cross. They have to be comfortable working with theory. But what's implied in that paper, well, actually, it, we're going to show you some data from Margaret Kiley's paper, but Gina and Ma Margaret's work as well implies confidence. And I see this a lot in my work with students, especially writing for publication. Whenever we have a Q&A session about arguments and about writing a paper for publication, 90% of the questions are things like, but I don't really know that I have an argument. Like, I'm just, I'm not even a finished PhD student yet. Um, how do I have anything to say? And I, I just don't feel confident doing this. I just don't feel confident saying this is what it is. And, and that's what I have to do to write this paper. And how do I become more confident was actually a question in those exact words a student asked me three weeks ago. So it's there, but it's implied. Um, 
And what also is implied in those kinds of papers is things like you've got to be persistent because this stuff is hard. And anybody in this room who's done a PhD or is doing a PhD will know that there are days where you just think, what was I thinking? I can't do a PhD. This is really hard. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I remember, <laughs> I remember rereading the chapter on semantic density and knowledge and knowers literally two months before I handed in my thesis. And then having a really bad three days because I said to Lawrence, I don't actually understand LCT. I don't understand LCT and I'm using it in my PhD. I can't get a PhD. I have no idea what the theory means. And of course, Lawrence is my husband, for those of you who don't know. And he very kindly said, why don't you just put the book down and go for a walk and take some time off and come back and everything will be fine. And it turned out I did actually understand semantic density in the end. But I, you, know, you have to persist through those patches. You can't just kind of fall apart and get paralyzed. You've got to push through the hard stuff. And that also implies persistence, resilience, motivation. It implies um, some level of emotional um, intelligence, if you like, I don't really like that term, but I can't think of another one right now, around kind of saying, I need help. Who do I go and ask for help? Um, how do I get help? Um, so it's, what's interesting is that we see these kinds of attributes or dispositions mentioned both explicitly and implicitly over and over again in the papers that we're reading. And so in our coding process, what we're seeing is Successful students are confident, resilient, persistent, independent, collaborative, creative, innovative, assertive, and also mentioned are the ability to be adaptable, motivated, self-regulated, enthusiastic, and reflective. And what the field seems to be suggesting, although they don't really seem to be like saying this outright, is that you can have a thesis without necessarily developing all of these dispositions. But if you want to be a successful academic, if you want to be a successful doctor, especially if you're staying in academia, you need more than just the epistemological process to go well. You need all of this other stuff to actually, you almost need all of this other stuff to make the project happen in a way that then enables you to go on and do other kinds of work afterwards. Okay, so all of us characters, those attributes and distributions on top of all the other expectations, that's a lot of things that you need to be and need to do. And it implies a very complex process of becoming. But what does the field of doctoral education generally focus on? What do universities prioritize? The person, which implies a focus on the more axiological or nori parts of the process, or the product, which implies a focus on the more epistemological or knowledge parts of the process. Now, as we have seen around the world, what is most prevalent in doctoral education and training is the timely completion of dissertations that make novel contributions to knowledge and which hopefully leads to publications, lots of publications, right? But this also, imp or this implies a focus on PhD graduates being career ready. Um, and in this study, that means uh, graduates who are able to do independent research, uh, publish their papers, supervise their own students, engage in academic life in a range of ways. And if you go from being a student to a supervisor, like that's a big jump. I mean, if you just look at it in terms of teaching, if you go from a student to becoming a tutor or a lecturer, that's a huge jump and there's a lot of expectations that are suddenly thrown into that. Um, but what this does mean is that this creates, if it's not focused on explicitly and helped and taught and everything, then this creates a cycle where what is predominantly valued is the product of the research over and above the researchers themselves. So what we are asking here is, does the successful completion of a thesis mean that you are a career ready, successful researcher, writer, or scholar? Now, a recent study conducted in South Africa by Van Skalkwijk et al. Uh, argued that part of success at PhD level is sharing their research beyond the thesis, primarily, but not only in peer reviewed journals. 
So they looked at the proportion of doctoral theses that resulted in journal um, publication. Now, this large scale quantitative study found that out of PhDs awarded over a 10 year period, 47.6% published at least one journal article. However, the overall findings show that many graduates are not actually disseminating their research in these ways. Um, so if you think about it, the research kind of stops at the PhD. So you do the research, you get the PhD, and then that research kind of stops. Like it's not disseminated further beyond that. It's not elaborated on. Um, so this raises questions about the impact of their research on the fields of study and practice. So for our purposes, what we are wondering is, if this is an expectation, then what does it mean in terms of what kinds of dispositions as well as research, subject and writing knowledge you need in order to move beyond the PhD into a successful academic career? Is it just a knowledge question? We think no. Um, our experience with our own careers and also the work that Sharon has done with postgraduate and postdoc students around writing for publication out of thesis research shows that many of the stumbling blocks are effective, like confidence and self-esteem, resilience in the face of rejection and having to redo that paper over and over again. And sometimes you want to throw your laptop against the wall because why am I still working on this? And, you know, criticism from reviewers, which can be nice, but also usually not nice, right? But also persistence. And these are just some of the like attributes that you need to develop during and beyond the uh, PhD. So <clears throat> the study is picking up on these cues from the field that we've seen and the relative, what we're thinking of as vagaries and nebulousness around the affective aspects of doing a PhD compared relative to the more explicit process of designing, conducting and writing research in the form of a thesis or dissertation especially. So we started with a paper we presented at LCT3. Uh, um, some of you might have been there. We got some nice feedback at that presentation. And we were initially using semantic waves to try and capture this process of early doctoral student to late doctoral student. And we were using um, Martina's uh, thesis and the feedback conversations she and I and the co-supervisor had in the margins as our data at that point. And what we realized um, in trying to prepare the paper was that the semantic waves, just the profiles just weren't quite capturing the complexity of what we were looking at. And so we started drawing things that we then realized look quite a lot like clusters. And at that point, we didn't know very much about constellations at all. Um, so now we've turned in earnest to this, this um, other tool from LCT and specifically the concepts of axiological semantic density for now and axiological condensation. And very specifically, we've been super inspired by Elena Lambrinos' work on developing dance and dances because this has, as we see it, quite a few parallels with developing doctoral theses and doctoral researchers. So at this point, and this is really where we also need help because um, I gotta tell you, man, this stuff is hard. <laughs> I've, done, I've been working with LCT for a long, long, long time now, and this is really Martina and I go round and round and round. So we hope we're not telling you things that are not true, um, but this is our understanding of what we're doing at this point in time. And we're drawing on um, Lee Rusniak's um, chapter in the, I have it next to me here, the Building Knowledge and Higher Education book, which came out last year. Um, Carl Mayton and Yake and Doran's work, their early, um, working papers, but also the chapter in teaching science that's just come out and Eleanor's thesis. Um, and this is underscoring our understanding of constellations at this point. So Carl argues in Knowledge and Knowers in um, chapter nine that cosmologies are powerful because they enable us to see social practices in joined up constellated ways. So what we, what we found really helpful about this is that it's helping us to see a range of different practices in connected ways rather than in discrete ways. And what we're hoping to be able to get to is that we're able to then distill or, or um, characterize a set of organizing principles that guide the creation and deployment of 
um, the constellations. We're going to show you a constellation or part of a constellation in, in a few minutes. Um, in a way, in, so the deployment of these constellations in ways that shape the kinds of knowers and the kinds of knowledges. So for our purpose, what we're moving towards, we think, we hope, is a cosmology around doctoral education that contains or that is made up of different joined up constellations that then speak to a set of organizing principles that says these are the kinds of doctoral knowers we value and want to produce and want to reproduce and want to create and nurture. We're not quite there yet, but we hope we're moving in that direction. So following Mason and Doran's 2021 chapter in teaching science, out now for those of you who want to buy it, <laughs> a constellation is um, made up of groupings of nodes, which may include clusters. And clusters are groupings of nodes. So a node, is a practice or belief or attitude. And these can be related to one another into a cluster. And then you can, it seems, either join up clusters into a larger constellation, which we're gonna show you for our study, or it seems like also nodes can be joined up into a constellation. And then these can be more or less condensed in terms of how many meanings are packed into them. So condensation, um, which we know from the dimension of semantics, uh, semantic density particularly, is the process of adding meanings. So how we are applying this right now is in relations, relation to adding meanings to nodes, which is creating clusters that then have relative strengths and weaknesses of axiological semantic density. So meanings around the being and becoming stuff, not around the knowledge stuff. Um, and this analysis, using this analysis, um, also enables us to see that some practices are desirable, which means that they're positively charged in the literature. They're good. You should be like that. You should do that. And then other practices are negatively charged or undesirable in that context. So those are the tools that we're taking from Constellation so far. In addition, um, we're looking at axiological condensation. So there are two forms of condensation in um, this, um, it's not a dimension, this part of LCT. See, I, I think, get stuck on I the I think words. the way of saying what it would be called? that you're going, to, oh. you're going to explore two forms of condensation because there are okay. many, many, okay. many, there are as many forms of condensation as there are combinations of code modalities. Oh, so yeah. minimum 256. Okay, so just ignore that, <laughs> we're gonna change that. We're exploring two forms of condensation. We're actually exploring one, but we think the other one's important because um, in doctoral education, these two things are almost impossible to separate, even in the papers that specifically focus on emotions and things like that. It's always in relation to writing a dissertation, actually doing a PhD. So. We have axiological condensation, which relates to the building of the knowers. Um, for those of you who know specialization, this seems to be related to social relations. So the knowery stuff, who are you becoming as the specialized knower in this context and how are we building that person? And then epistemological condensation relates to the knowledge building or in specialization, the epistemic relations. So what what kinds of procedural, technical, principle, theoretical knowledge, what are the um, particular ways in which you have to do this thing to be recognized um, as having achieved the basis for success. And the process of condensation is adding meanings to the symbols and practices that are part of who you become and also how you know what you know. Um, so we're really interested, obviously, as you can hopefully tell so far, in the axiological dimension of all of this, in the meanings that are added to the affective stances or attitudes or beliefs um, that seem to signal a successful student and, an, and then, by contrast, an unsuccessful student. So we're, um, follow we, we're following Elena quite a lot here because um, she really makes this stuff um, much, much clearer in terms especially of um, axiological um, semantic density. So the building of meanings around um, 
the affective stuff and how also not just what the meanings are and how they're condensed, but how they're charged, what is desirable and positively charged and what is undesirable and negatively charged. And we're using this, this tool has been incredibly powerful for us so far because we're asking two related questions. So firstly, what is an authentic or valid or valued doctoral identity and what goes into building this? And if the field of doctoral education is hugely invested in graduates developing such an identity, but weirdly leaves much of the process of, of doing this quite tacit or um, open to interpretation, then what does this mean for greater, but also more equitable and inclusive success at this level? So to enact this analysis, we have found this tool from Eleanor's PhD work really, really helpful as a thinking and also analysis tool at this point. So in essence, Eleanor um, looks at developing dance and developing dancers in her PhD. And she argues that dances are built over time in the form of a hierarchical Noah structure. So this means that there is some kind of ideal Noah right at the top of this pyramid that we all need to become. And potentially this is quite an exclusive ideal because it doesn't represent everybody. So to get here, you have to train or cultivate some actions as being relevant or useful to becoming this Noah. And then you have to push aside or devalue and unlearn others. And these actions are then subsumed into more generalized behaviors. And again, there's a process of valuing some behaviors over others and training and cultivation so that you begin behaving in the right kinds of ways. And then these behaviors and actions are turned inward to become internalized dispositions. And again, some are valued and cultivated and others are devalued and pushed aside or um, um, yeah, pushed out. So what we think is that probably <laughs> reading this field, there are likely much finer degrees of analysis we could do around aspects of doctoral Noah building that take into account different institutional and national contexts, different disciplinary contexts, and also changes in fields over time. But we for, for now are just using the, the border strokes in this study. And we think probably you can also work backwards. So if you see dispositions that you don't like, you can then unpack this in terms of saying, well, what behaviors are they engaged in that are problematic? What actions are they doing that are not the right kinds of things for them to be doing? And conversely, if you see a disposition that you do value, hopefully what we think, what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to say, well, you could work backwards and say, what are the successful behaviors? What are the successful actions? Can you make this process less tacit, less vague? Um, so that more students can actually have access to um, what counts as success in this field. Okay, so we are just going to focus on one disposition today, and that's a pretty big one in this cosmology of doctoral success, which is confidence. Um, now we are using a still growing data set of published papers that we have gathered through a process of snowball sampling, starting with papers that focus on dispositions overtly and then using references and citations to find uh, related papers. So on the right are just a few, <laughs> like a very small selection of some of the uh, papers from our, from our data set. Now, we are arguing that in the data so far, there is evidence of four subtypes or forms of confidence that successful doctoral students need to cultivate or build. Um, these are not separate, of course, they are linked to one another in stronger and weaker ways. And we are still very much working on this during our analysis process. But then so far we have distilled confidence into these four types. So the first is intrinsic confidence. So that's one's innate belief in the ability to complete the PhD, a sense of worthiness, a sense of belonging to the broader research community. Uh, the second one is technical confidence. That is being confident in the ability to both do the research and write the thesis and the various sub steps that go with that, because those are not just two things, they're consisting of many things. Um, 
epistemological confidence, which is being confident that one knows the field well enough, um, that one knows how their project contributes to the field, as well as confidence in the project itself, that it is worth undertaking. And then lastly, relational confidence, which is the confidence to engage with peers and scholars and supervisors about your work, which is always terrifying. And then to share your work with others, whether it is to get advice or feedback or to show off what you have done. Um, however, these don't exist in isolation. They are relational. So intrinsic confidence will feed into technical and epistemological and relational confidence, while epistemological confidence could feed into intrinsic and technical and relational confidence. And then moreover, as we will show eventually, confidence itself is interlinked with other dispositions and vice versa. So everything is kind of like smooshed together. So now we will show you a little bit of how we've gone about coding this data. For today, we are only focusing on the first two forms of confidence, so intrinsic and technical, mostly because we don't have time for all four, and also because we haven't actually written up the other two yet. So we need to focus on two for today. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a snapshot of our raw data. It's long, it's a long and ever increasing table in Google Drive. And as we read articles, we input the data with notes on the focus of the paper on the far right, uh, the citation on the far left, and each column in between represents a disposition which is either implied in the paper or explicitly stated. I feel like it should say like spoiler, it's mostly implied. It's a lot of like reading between the lines. So the notes represent the actions and behaviors that are linked to the disposition and we are including positively and negatively charged aspects of PhD study. Um, we are kind of finding, we think that especially in the cases where the dispositions are more implied or between the lines, that we are able to get to them through the descriptions or definitions in the papers of successful and unsuccessful actions and behaviors that doctoral students should or should not exhibit or cultivate. So papers don't necessarily go, this is the attribute that you should have, but in talking about what students should be able to do or should not do, we are able to infer the valued or undesired uh, dispositions. So a lot of papers talk about managing your emotions, so they don't explicitly go, you should manage your emotions and remain calm and objective, but, in, but it's implied in the way they talk about managing emotions. So that is something that, is, you, that you need to do. Um, an example Sharon used is like, nobody tells you don't cry in supervision, but it's kind of implied, don't cry <laughs> during the super, like when you meet your supervisors, for instance. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so I suppose in that case, crying would be an undesirable action and being overly emotional would probably maybe be part of the behavior you mustn't be very you must behave in a very calm way um and be very sort of rational and 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 confident you know not confident rational and sort of um focused on the process not on on your feelings you can feel your feelings outside of the space but not inside of the space and then the disposition there might then be um something to do with um probably i suppose something like um objective like objectivity or rationality that's very valued in the sciences and much more of an overt way than the social sciences but i think and what we're finding, generally speaking, is that objective, rational, calm PhD students are quite valued by everybody. <laughs> so we're still sort of thinking through all of this. There's so much data. At some point, we're going to have to press stop on the reading so that we can actually finish this paper. But what we'd like to show you now is um, our two, two of our um, four types of confidence that we are working with. So as a reminder, intrinsic confidence is about your innate belief in your ability to complete the PhD, and perhaps also your sense of belonging that you have in your research space or community, which is related to this. So this quote Sharon, comes from a paper. Yes, yes, yes. Can I just ask what's meant by innate belief? Well, I suppose we're seeing that as um, your own sense of yourself coming into this. So you can learn how to believe in yourself, but what we found is that often people um, 
in, in beginning a PhD, there is this sort of sense of, I can do this. I can do this PhD. I have what it takes. Um, so maybe the word innate is a bit of a problematic word, and we'll come back to that in the paper and define what we mean by that. But essentially what we mean is um, something that you carry in yourself that you kind of can tell yourself, you got this, you can do this, it's going to be okay, just keep going. Um, that's sort of what we see as intrinsic confidence. Oh, is, it, is, that is, it then, is it then perhaps like that it's confidence about uh, directed at a particular kind of focus or something? Um, uh, and it suggests to me like uh, invariant, unchanging, in essentialist. Um, right. And I no, don't that's know how not to what we mean by it. I know you just said, but I don't so know how to distinguish note. the. Uh, I don't know how to distinguish confidence that's about yourself from confidence about. Well, if it's confidence about your knowledge of something else, then I guess it's um, uh, they're externally directed kinds of confidence, mm. like you know, epistemological is an externally. My confidence mm. about my knowledge of this area, whereas right. this is my confidence about myself as a. So I suppose these are different things they're focused on. Yeah, that's a good confidence note. Confidence about so confidence about focus. this, confidence about that, confidence about the other. Is that the oh, difference between them? Yeah, no, that's quite helpful. Yeah, it probably is actually. Because we'll have the to reason think why I'm concerned but... <laughs> about it is because confidence sounds to me like it is entirely and always from within. Internal. Yeah. yeah, so the, trying to make one of them intrinsic suggests to me that the others are not. So but maybe it's, it's a different focal areas. Yeah, so like, you know, my confidence okay. about my, my directed knowledge towards, of, directed towards. you know, okay. like sociology as opposed to my confidence, yeah, about, I okay. suppose, about myself generally, I suppose, I don't know. Yes. I'm just trying to figure no, out no. what those differences were. That's a good note. Um, actually, that's quite a helpful way of thinking about it. So, okay, if we're going to recast that just quickly, then this would really be a focus on um, the self and your ability to do this and why you went into the PhD in the first place. And I suppose it's sort of self-talk um, that you engage in when you are struggling or when things are going well. Um, you know, we all have conversations with ourselves all the time. So I suppose that's kind of what we were thinking about here. And you see that a little bit in the data quote. So this quote comes from a paper by Lynn McAlpin and her colleagues. And it was looking at narratives of doctoral neglect and struggle. So this extract comes from um, a narrative about a student they call Randall. And um, the emphasis we've added around what we, what we think um, it relates to actions, behaviors, and dispositions um, that appear to be both positively and negatively charged in relation to one another. And some of it's stated and some of it's implied. So I'll just um, read this quickly in case it's a bit small for some of you. While Randall has been accepted in this new department, the fact that his topic was controversial and his research setting physically dangerous caused departmental members to urge him to change topics. However, with the eventual support of his supervisor, Randall carried out the proposed research. Since returning from his field work, Randall's supervisor has taken lengthy leaves of absence. In the first, Randall was left virtually unsupervised. In the second, sorry, somebody has their microphone on. Sorry. It was very loud in my ear for a minute there. In the first, Randall was left virtually unsupervised. In the second, he created an arrangement with two other supervisors, both carefully selected to avoid the discouragements he had previously experienced. While behind schedule, Randall is confident he will finish and describes the whole process as affirming. He has seen his self-confidence increase significantly and is proud to have stuck with his topic despite having faced rejection and criticism. Randall has not sought formal institutional support. He has relied on his girlfriend for emotional support and on his own resolve that failure was never an option. So, look, disclaimer, we're still working this all out and we're still playing with these concepts. But what we saw in um, this uh, extract of, of what we're using as our data is that a self-confident Randall um, his self-confidence was to some extent boosted by the fact that he created his own support, but it also led to him being able to create his own support. His resolve that he would not fail 
um, was perhaps part of why he um, sought the particular kinds of support that he sought from alternate supervision and also from his girlfriend. Um, but there's also this notion of him very carefully selecting his alternate supervision because of what um, damaged his self-confidence before, which was the discouragement from his supervisors. So he stuck with it and he refused to fail. And those things appear to us to be quite positively charged. Whereas on the other hand, bowing to pressure, believing that the discouragements and critique and therefore changing your topic or dropping out, that would be less successful behavior. Having no support, being isolated, having an absent supervisor and doing nothing about it or not making any sort of choices about that um, that would help you, those things appear to be negatively charged. So um, one more. So what we're talking about in terms of technical confidence is focused on doing the research and on coping with the writing process, the nuts and bolts of writing really, more than how you feel about your writing. And these three quotes, this data comes from three papers, all of which are focused on thesis writing specifically, and especially how supervisors help students to become more confident and competent writers. And those words are used in these papers as well, confident and competent. So again, the emphasis is added around actions and behaviors and implied or stated dispositions. And, and these we think probably might change a little bit because every time we read these quotes, we see different things. Um, so here we go. And um, this is from Margaret Kiley's paper being stuck in ways that can be counterproductive and perhaps even destructive to self-confidence and self-esteem can have serious consequences for learners. For example, losing the will to remain with the program and the ability to complete in a timely fashion. It is not uncommon for learners prior to full understanding to mimic the language and behaviors they consider appropriate for the understanding with which they are struggling. However, it is when mimicry extends past the learning phase and becomes a proxy for learning that difficulties can arise. And then from Barbara Kamler and Pat Thompson's book on um, doctoral writing, helping doctoral students write, I think is the name of the book, Pedagogies for Supervision. This is, comes from chapter three, which is where they're talking about how to write a literature review. And they've got different examples of student texts and um, it's sort of almost like a what to do and what not to do kind of exercise. So this is a summary of two of the texts that are regarded as what not to do. In both Geraldine and Vera's texts, the literature is used neither to locate their studies nor to advance an argument about the state of the field in order to make the case for their own work. This is characteristic of diffident scholars who lack authority and who are literally overwhelmed by the work of others. And then finally, from Claire Atchison and Susan Mowbray's work on managing doctoral emotions, which talks very much about women doctoral students and their struggles with writing particularly. Negative experiences were often framed in terms of a lack of institutional slash supervisor support for writing, as well as my principal supervisor was very difficult to work with, which made the thesis writing experience so stressful. When students enjoyed the writing, they generally described satisfaction at developing skills and confidence. Quote, the enjoyment actually comes, so the enjoyment comes from actually finding pleasure in writing and upon reflecting on your writing progress. So what we saw here, and these are not complete because um, actually every time I read these quotes, I see other things, but what we see as this sort of more negatively charged cluster is around this diffident scholar, the scholar who behaves in a diffident way. And she's overwhelmed. And because she's overwhelmed, to some extent, she can't take any pleasure in the writing because it's just awful and hard all the time. She's mimicking, but to the point where it's become a proxy for her learning. So it's actually detracting from her confidence because she's becoming stuck and she can't make any progress. And she, as Kylie says, she knows there's something she doesn't know, but she can't get at it. And so she just feels stupid. Um, and also in terms of the writing, she's not taking an authoritative position. She's not 
actively locating her study in the field. She doesn't have her own argument. She doesn't have a case for her work. And she looks a little bit like a broken marionette, but that was accidental. I was just trying to draw it on the space that I had on the page. And then the positively charged cluster is a student who behaves more authoritatively. So to some extent, um, she uses this authoritative position to become more skilled at writing. And because she's more skilled, she doesn't have to mimic for too long. So she can move past the mimicry phase into authentic learning and writing and, and uh, confidence is related to that. Um, she takes pleasure in the writing because she's not hugely overwhelmed. So she can make progress. She's quite satisfied with how well things are going. She's taking a position in respect to the literature. She's got an argument. She's making a case for her work. So this obviously um, is a lot more valued. And it's related, I think, also probably when we start um, drawing this, it's so difficult when you're trying to do a 7,000 word paper with all of these complex things. But we think also linked in here is probably um, some, some stuff around persistence and also potentially resilience, because those are definitely implied in some of this, um, in some of this data. So back to Karen, Martina sorry, for now. It's Carol here. Yes. Hello, um, Carol. Hi. Pause it. Hi. Can I just ask a question? I'm, I'm, Please do. Um, I like, um, could you discuss why you've called that technical? Because to me, technical oh. refers to kind of like actually being able to use APA citations correctly and that ah. sort of stuff. To me, it's much more epistemological about because your authority in your writing is located within your um, uh, confidence in the knowledge and the position that you're putting forward. So I don't I, know. Um, I, I also Martina want to say a similar sort that. of thing, um, which is that okay. technical would suggest to me confidence in the knowledge of the technicality of a subject area. Right. Mm -hmm. So I Martina, was suggesting. Martina, you wrote this bit. Can you answer? Sharon. <laughs> Martina wrote this bit, so she needs to answer it. <laughs> well, at the time, because I was thinking about it, because it was more about the, the nuts and bolts, if you like, of doing research, of writing, so like the actual writing and engaging with feedback and stuff. And I also played around with procedural confidence. So, I mean, this is still very much, as we said, like a work So this is why we and, need this yeah. feedback. <laughs> yeah. So Avoid we, procedural we kind of, because of its um, it, it's confusing with procedural knowledge as a category yeah. used by the people. Processual is not used by anybody, and it's about process. So you could use processual. Okay. Okay. Processual confidence. But technical Thank suggests you. knowledge of the technicality. So I'm with Carol on that. But I think you mean the confidence in the process of how you do things. Hmm. Yeah, that actually makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Thank useful. You. Thank you. Yeah. See, this is why we wanted to come to the round table. So you guys can help us. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay, what we're supposed Martina. to do as a community, help each other. Yes, exactly. No, no, this is great. This is what we need. Okay, Martina, this is you. Uh, which one is this? Oh, which one? This is a uh, confident, confident one. one. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. <laughs> no, no, okay. that's okay. So if we connect Oh, sorry, if we consolidate or connect the two clusters, so based on the intrinsic and processual confidence, then what we have drawn so far, uh, that we have drawn so far for the successful PhD student, then we have this very early constellation of learnings around what confidence looks like. And um, so what actions and behaviors lead to the building or uh, cultivation of a confident disposition. Um, so, yeah. Next slide. <laughs> yeah, so similarly, if we connect up the other negatively charged uh, clusters, we have this constellation of actions and behaviors that may lead to, and we call it unconfident because we're not very happy with the direct antonym of confidence. So we kind of go with unconfident at the moment. Um, so, but of the unconfident PhD scholar, like this would look something like this. Um, now, what is very useful here is that these constellations show us that the notion of becoming and being confident is actually pretty complex and axiologically, semantically dense. So if you say to a student, you need to be more confident in your writing, then what are you actually asking them to do in terms of concrete actions, more generalized behaviors, and then these internalized dispositions. So we are just looking here at two out of a 
four possible forms of confidence and maybe we find more um, that we find so far um, and also at a handful of a larger set of paper, uh, published papers um, although the same kinds of actions and behaviors do seem to come around over and over it is already fairly complex um, like this in terms of building what confidence means just in terms of these two types or forms so we are fairly confident in our findings so far, although, as we say, this is still very much a work in progress. <laughs> Sorry, can I come in here? Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Hi, it's, Lee. It's Lee. It's Lee. Um, so I'm, I'm quite interested um, or intrigued by the, you, a couple of times you've, you've got um, something like believed critique as negatively charged. Um, and I just wanted to, to find out a little bit more about that because, I mean, when, when I certainly write, I, I give it to close um, colleagues and so on, and I say to them, please, you know, give me your harshest possible feedback because I'd rather hear it now than to put my work, and public, you know, out there or, or, or so on. Um, and I, I find critique a really powerful, very productive, very generative thing. And it, 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 it lifts me to the next level all the time. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm just very interested to, to, to hear a little bit more why believing critique from scholars, established scholars, you know, who, who know more, who, who've got expertise in that field or whatever, would, would be part of... of kind of a negative um, process because I'm, personally I, I, I really welcome that. Um, no sure I agree with you we do the same thing but this was very much in terms of related to Randall's situation where his supervisors has said this isn't going to work this is a bad idea and um, we're critiquing your plan for this research because it's dangerous and you should change topics you should do something else. So this wasn't necessarily critique in the sense of let's have a look at your writing and see how to help you make it better. So maybe it should be more believing the discouragement um, here because it was really more about if he had believed them that he couldn't do this, that it wasn't going to work, that this was a very bad idea, then he would have bowed to the pressure and dropped out or changed his topic or left the university or done something else. You can see more of that if you see the longer narrative. But um, this wasn't critique in the sense that you're talking about. This was more in the sense of um, you can't do this. This is not going to work. Like you have to do something different. So maybe critique is the wrong word there. Maybe it really should be more about discouragement or criticism or um, dissuasion, maybe. Yeah. Okay, Mark thanks. So if that answers your question. Mark Who does? wants to ask a question. Oh, sure. May, may I just come in, and, and I, yes, I really want to come in from the person standing outside of LCG theory and, and that kind of background of drawing on that kind of theoretical framing for a study. And I, I want to ask whether the analysis of the individual seems to be uh, disconnected from a sociological political context. And it, it seems that you're attributing these particular traits or characteristics almost as if they're embedded in the self rather than understanding the individual as a particular member of a society. So for example, I don't know the race, the background, the, the, the class perspective of Randall, for example, to be able to make sense of why does Randall have those particular interpretations of self? Where do they come from? Are they historical? Are they sociological? Are they political? So I think for me, what I'm hearing the constellation to be very much circumscribed by a personalistic dimension rather than a dimension that locates individuals within a broader sociological framing. And therefore the idea of voice also comes in in relation to how individuals understand what doctrineness is in being able to be contributing to a social agenda, a social body of knowledge making. And I know that you might consider that to be more on the epistemological terrain, but I, I think 
What I'm arguing for in my comment is the intersection between the individual and the social political spaces within which they operate. So I, I don't know whether uh, the constellation needs to add other uh, dimensions or forces to uh, layer onto it in order to make uh, a deeper analysis of it. Can I just add before thank you, you jump in and respond uh, that, that yeah. thank you. Uh, I, I don't think we've met Michael, but thank you because that's exactly I was really similar to what I was going to ask later, which is um, who are these people and what are their backgrounds and, and so on and so on. And people were talking about Archer. And one of the things I have a problem with, with all this stuff about reflexivity and so on, is it seems incredibly middle class um, first world sort of reflexivity that they often talk about. But it becomes very methodologically individualist. Um, if we don't watch out. We certainly do go into more of that in the methodology in the paper. Um, that's a good comment because we can include more of that when we write about this data, but we are about to get to the implications because we definitely don't see this as an individual or solo project. Um, this is very much related to the socio-political, socio-cultural contexts in which these students work. Um, but that is a very useful point because it just means we need to foreground that very clearly in the paper itself so that people don't think that we're just talking about what individuals need to do in terms of both students and supervisors because we don't see this as that at all. This is very much what does the field of doctoral education want students to be and where do those expectations come from and those are very much informed by particular sets of I think you called them like sociological beliefs or values or ways of being. And actually, I mean, it might well be invoking a particular kind of middle classness way of being or a particular kind of, in some contexts, um, whiteness. So in some contexts, maybe also, you know, as Sarah Ahmed argues, it, behaviors or, or ways of being that are related to objectivity and rationality and calmness in the face of pressure are often masculine con um, attributes. And uh, Claire Atchison, for example, talks in their paper about women particularly have um, different ways in which they manage their emotions and almost try to behave less like um, hysterical females and more like calm, rational and objective um, men in those spaces. And so there are definitely characteristics. I'm looking at this in, in related research in a larger project. There are characteristics that are masculinized and feminized and the feminized characteristics are often negatively charged and the masculinized characteristics are positively charged. And this doesn't always happen very overtly. It often happens quite tacitly like, you know, <laughs> It's, it's a long story and I'm going to get to it in this paper that I'm writing at the moment. So watch the space for details, but it's definitely there's stuff that happens in the educational space in postgraduate and particularly doctoral education that is very much between the lines and underneath the surface and students kind of know coming into a PhD almost how they're supposed to behave. But then the question is, how do they know that? Did somebody come out and tell them this is how a successful student behaves? what is going on in that space that just m communicates to us particular ways of being like, how is our behavior cultivated? How are our actions um, censored by our supervisors? Um, so in some cases it can be quite overt if the supervisor wants to talk to you about what they think um, a good PhD is in their field and how PhD students should behave and what they should do and what kinds of things they value. But, Nine times out of 10, I don't think that that is, I mean, it wasn't overt between me and my supervisor at all. Um, so yeah, very good question. And we're gonna talk a bit now about what we think this all means. And hopefully that will answer some of the questions, but we can obviously keep talking about it because we do still have some time before Martina has to go off and teach. <laughs> okay, so over to you, Martina. Okay. Um, okay, so what does this all mean? <laughs> to go back to the beginning, uh, we found that in our own doctoral becoming and being processes, there were these tacit and sometimes explicit expectations or rules of the game that we were supposed to be completely able to play while we were doing our PhDs and also when we were finished with our PhDs. 
Um, but our concern was that maybe we could work this all out because we are both middle class. We both speak, read, write, and think in the language in which we do research. We are from the context in which we are doing research. We have both attended middle class schools and have both, uh, both have strong undergraduate and prior honors and master's degrees as a foundation. And we both had really supportive supervision and also family relationships. And if I can just add to what Sharon was saying about like the behaviors that are implicitly acceptable and so on. Sharon's my supervisor and like, even though we got along really well, I knew that I can't go, Sharon, why are you making me write another draft? I am so angry with you right now because I would like to be done. Like that is not an acceptable thing. And I, even though I wanted to cry, I didn't cry because I knew like I would cry afterwards, but like, you know, and it was a very nice supervision like experience. It wasn't a horrible one. Um, and even in those contexts, there are certain things that are valued and not valued and so on. Um, but then what about students who don't have all of this? What about the first in family and or international students and or non-native language speakers and or students who are working class and or students changing fields and are coming from less well-established prior educational backgrounds or experiences and or students who are not in support of family and or supervision relationships? Success seems to be more, um, the sum of the parts are more than just being able to put together a thesis that passes examination. Real academic success, meaning a career ready graduate, understood as being able to act as an independent, creative and organized and motivated and persistent, networked, confident, researcher, scholar, supervisor or academic, depends on knowledge cultivation and on lower cultivation and both need to be explicit uh, unpacked and visible in doctoral supervision and education so, so um what we're hoping what we think we're going to be able to show with this research what with this paper is that becoming a successful phd student is a lot more complex than it may at first appear if you read the field so what counts as confident or resilient or independent is always, it seems, about more than just one thing. And to follow Michael's point, like what this means may be different in different contexts. It may be different in different institutions. It may be different in different disciplines. It may be different with different students, um, different kinds of students. Um, so what we hope is that at least we can begin to surface different, all the different possible or, as, or many of the different possible meanings um, that the field holds um, for success and then begin to have a more nuanced conversation about supervision and also wider doctoral support and training in terms of how these spaces can make these actions, behaviors and dispositions more visible, more learnable and more achievable. But then because this is not just about you as an individual need to become better at this and you must figure out how to be confident and persistent and resilient in all these ways. And, you know, the space itself is not the issue, it's you. We want to actually say, well, you know, related to inclusion, once we can begin to actually say, this is the, these are the constellations, these are the chargings, these are the meanings that are, are embedded in all of this, especially the tacit ones um, that are between the lines. What we're hoping is that we can start having probably much harder conversations about who we are including and valuing and whether in invoking a particular set of dispositions that we think are neutral. We think, well, it's just, this is just what you have to be to be successful. It's, this is not about a particular kind of person. This is just about a successful uh, um, doctorate. That actually what we might be doing is invoking particular ways of being in the world that privilege some and um, exclude others. So, you know, are we, for example, invoking particular ways of being successful that um, exclude black and indigenous students in certain contexts that may exclude women in certain contexts that may exclude queer or disabled students or international students in certain contexts. Are, are these ways of being really neutral? Uh, probably not. No. And let's actually, not forget but, like the most important probably, which is social class. I mean, like, um, yes, well, yes, exactly. Objective so, distance form over function, the ability to mm. play with ideas at a, uh, in a sort of detached way, the, Mm. ability to not take things personally and that sort of stuff all those are incredibly uh, associated with 
the um, with the bourgeoisie, with the middle class, and the, oh, for and sure. the educated, particularly the cultural bourgeoisie, not the industrial, uh, the yeah. cultural middle class, and the ability to stand back and kind of play with ideas with as if you're using very large tongs or chopsticks and they're <laughs> at a distance, you know, and they're not um, they're not like something that just reflects immediately on you. It's an incredibly uh, cultural middle class attribute that one has to learn to succeed at or to at least pass at if you're going to be successful and not be seen as a very prickly person because usually it's psychologized. Nobody says mm. often at high PhD level, nobody normally says, Oh, well, don't worry about uh, social class is quite hard to see often, but they say, no, don't worry about Carl is it's because of his so working class upbringing. It'd be more like, Oh, he's just a psychologist. You know, he's like a really prickly person or something like that, you know? So social class is also an issue as well. I mean, don't forget that not, it's not the case that all men are objectified and calm and rational and so on. In fact, they're the ones no, who sure. murder women. But there is certainly some research in feminist studies that shows that those have become masculinized, even if they're not actually the attributes that all men have. Um, which, anyway, I'm still thinking about that. I'm still reading Sara Ahmed and, and feminist theory, so I can't talk too much about that at this point. Watch the space for details, as I said. But that, that's a good point because you know, kind of our contention in, in starting this paper was to say, we can't have this wider conversation. You know, we, we're quite likely to be gaslighted if we try and have this conversation um, with just like anecdotes and, oh, but you know, if you just look at doctoral education, you can kind of see this. So we thought we need to be able to kind of, what we want to do is we want to take what the field is already talking about and has been talking about for quite some time. Um, and we want to try and not only say, hey, these are the things you're actually saying, but what we find so powerful about this tool is we can say, do you see how, how complex this is? Do you see how it's all interconnected? Persistence is not just, oh, well, just be persistent. It's all of these different kinds of actions and behaviors that can um, be turned inward to develop the internalized disposition of persistence. But what persistence looks like for a middle-class student who doesn't have to worry about finances, who's got lots of support, who's networked, if you read um, going to university, the influence of higher education on the lives of young South Africans, which you can download from African Minds for free by Jenny Case, Sue McKenna, Delia Marshall, and Deza Mogashana, they show very clearly how um, social class, like being middle class especially, gives you access to all sorts of things that help you succeed at university. And some of the things are things you wouldn't even think about. Like, you know, you can get an internship because your dad knows somebody, you know somebody, or your mom's got a friend who can find you a place in their company, etc. So, you know, what persistence looks like for one student is very different to what persistence might look like for another student. And it might require different kinds of conversations and supervision rather than this sort of sense of, well, this is just the value and you must just do it. Um, and if you can't do it, then there's something wrong with you. Maybe you shouldn't be doing a PhD. Not to go back to Michael's question, there's actually something wrong with this environment. This environment is valuing a very exclusive way of being an ideal PhD student that is not representative of the vast diversity of students who are doing PhDs and who are quite capable of doing PhDs, but they're made to look like they're not capable because what they bring in terms of their, if you like, social capitals is not valued um, in the same ways or at all compared to other kinds of ways of being that are valued. So what we're hoping is that and we, we kind of feel like this paper is a first step to just say what you're actually talking about is quite complex and what you're talking about is also related to ways of being in the world that come with students into this space and uh, we have to start problematizing this rather than continuing to present this as just a kind of neutral set of dispositions that are related to success as if success is one kind of thing and not quite a complex concept. So uh, we've had some comments and conversation already, but uh, Martina has to go in a few minutes because she's got to teach, but I can hang out for a little bit longer if people have um, comments and questions. Yeah, we have a few minutes um, uh, to go. Uh, if people just I'm jump gonna in, stop people. Sharing. Carol, Carol, that's please, okay. just jump yeah, in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. Thanks, uh, Sharon and uh, Martina. I was just thinking about the South African perspective. You know, I think I think this focus on axiological stuff is really, really important. And it was just make me thinking 
you know, in South Africa in the last 20 years. So there's been this huge emphasis on increasing the number of PhDs and thus a huge intake of PhD students, not enough supervisors, supervisors mm. are overloaded. And I think in that, in that sense, what it means is that supervisors then don't have the time and often the energy yeah. <laughs> because you're now supervising 10 PhD students instead of only three or whatever, it's very hard, I find, to actually have the energy and the, the kind of, um, <laughs> or, yeah, I don't know what else to call it, the kind of emotional energy to engage. It is emotional with, energy, I think, yeah. A lot of that dispositional stuff, you know, so I think for the, the emphasis on, on, on what supervisors need to do is really, really hard and it's not being yeah. acknowledged. Um, I think the cohort stuff can can really help and is very important in order to create communities of practice that can um, model the, these kind of ways of being, because I think a lot of it is tacit and it's not easy to just speak it out. A lot of it is about seeing how people engage with each other. How do you see colleagues working with each other, um, working with ideas and, and all of that sort of stuff. But I think the way in South Africa, because we've kind of pushed this numbers game, uh, we really, really have focused on product and not sufficiently on, on, on process and, and, and person. Yeah. And uh, yeah, to me, it, 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 I've always thought about the kind of work we need to do about supervisors <laughs> and not yes. only just, uh, just students. I don't know if anyone's doing that work, but anyway, just a, just to put it out there, but thanks for, no, thank for you, making Carol. A lot I'm going to make a note. Out. And before I add, <laughs> because several people have got their hands up, I just want to jump in and say, um, that's really interesting, Carol's good point. When I had a cohort, I had four finish at once, five in a year, and I had loads of people at once. I mean, now I have uh, very few, almost none, so nobody wants to be supervised by me but uh, anymore. But I, they'd almost killed me, and they'd almost killed them, having them all finish at once. But we had weekly meetings. I don't know if Kirsten's here, but she's written about it recently and hopefully it'll be come out. Kirsten wanted how... to come, but she got locked out of her house. So she's ah, not here. So, well, yeah. we, uh, this is for another time, but um, we had a weekly S club thing, which, which was intended to try and do that, to do, to deal with that labor and model mm. and so on and so on. Uh, the peer as well, and not just me, but uh, I think uh, normally had a hand up and um, I don't know how to say it, Birut also has a hand up. So normally, do you want to start? So I thought I saw your hand first. Just jump in. Yes. Yeah, no, I just, um, I'm going back to the boring sort of analysis stuff, Sharon. So yeah, away from all these amazing discussions, which I think are really, really pertinent because I remember, you know, social class is completely um, shifted when you're an immigrant, right? You're taken, you take on a whole new meaning when you come to a new context. So I remember being... Mm from privilege to coming to uh, Australia where people would peer at me lovingly and say, oh, darling, you speak very nicely. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm a native speaker of English. And suddenly I was a non speaker of English. What? It's not my first language. I'm not bilingual. But yeah, so that's a, that, it's uh. really But I think also I, I like, one of the things that I love about Constellations, it's showing you exactly what you talked about. Just a snapshot of what's going on within that field and all the discussions within it that can be biased, that can be excluding certain things. And when you, it's only when you start to map it out that you can, you know, see what the um, shortcomings are in a sense. I think with actually trying to deal with the data, um, maybe what Carl mentioned earlier, uh, who or what is that particular emotion or thing that you've identified as being evaluative aiming towards so is it the supervisor right. student the student's own emotions which are internal so uh, you know or, or something like i have confidence as opposed to i am confident about something or something triggering that confidence so trying to um maybe group things together clusters in according to those kinds of what or who is being evaluated <clears throat> No, that's a good point because our initial analysis, which we have kind of discarded, but maybe should go back to, is we had these kind of internal and external dimensions. So mm. internally, what's happening with persistence and then externally, how do you see a persistent student? Or um, So that was, that was the first sort of constellation we drew on a piece of paper. And maybe we should go back to that. Thank There's you. A, that's, um, no, because I'm doing notes. it myself right now. So it's just driving me. I know what you mean. So for me, I have to systematically go through 
what mm. is the evaluative item and what is it targeting and then i can see what and the group is so then i begin to see okay so you've got certain things grouping around the student confident not confident um you know uh what you know you had things like tenacious or not tenacious so things like are they persistent mm. or not persistent versus how they're viewed by their supervisors that's something different that's externalized um, as you put it and then also how they feel towards certain things their thesis the process the emotions um, so i feel like that they, that might make it i don't know more complex or more simple for you no <laughs> That's really useful feedback, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> I'm scribbling start, lots of notes here. <laughs> when you get into it, it just gets really, really tricky. And I also think that I saw in your analysis, and I'm not sure about this, um, but there were, seemed to be two levels of, um, you know, you were talking about in Elena's um, PhD. So the difference between the generalized versus the generalized persona of the individual uh, what should a PhD student be? That had its own set of categories of um, analysis, and that seemed to be the authorial uh, author, mm. the, the author of the paper. Do you know what I mean? So the papers, authors are saying, this is how we're interpreting this individual student's instance, and then we're giving you this little bit of evidence from the individual student's story. So right, there's, yeah. there's a specific level there. I don't know how you deal with that. Okay. No, we'll think about that though. I'm going to make a note. <laughs> can I just um, can I just jump in and because uh, I um, Birit's had a virtual hand up for quite a while. Do you want to jump in? Thanks, no. Oh no, not at all, Madam Emily. Don't worry. Oh look, Sharon, I just said that I'd like to say thanks for the talk. I've really thought thanks, a lot Birit. about different things, and um, yeah, I've got some. I just wanted to build a little bit on what Carl and Carol were talking about with supervision and grouping um, some of these. Uh, characteristics together. Uh, we've got a, in our institution, Charles Darwin University in the north of Australia, we've got a, um, well, our, our current graduate board of studies director is a psychologist. So he runs group sessions and he tries to implement some of this confidence building as structural workshops within the PhD process. So being aware of those um, leanings and, and uh, characteristics of a successful PhD student will, or candidate will be a really useful um, thing to share with him, which I will do when I actually talk to him next. So thanks, thanks very much. I'd just like to say that. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate the comments. <laughs> oh, this has been so helpful. This is what we were hoping for. We were like, we have to go and talk to people about this. And all of these different opportunities we've been given at all these different LCT groups have been brilliant because it forces us to actually sit down and think about the paper and do some writing and then obviously be brave and share it. So thank you. Uh, Michael, you have your hand up. <clears throat> uh, I was wondering, Sharon, whether the um, framework that you set up of looking at process, product, and person, um, identify the interconnection between those three dimensions. And I know a paper can't do everything, but I, I think it would be useful for the paper to be able to <clears throat> make an in, initial comment about uh, uh, the fact that product does influence person as well process does influence the kind of individual as well, but that the choice of your paper is to be demarcating on the nature of the person. But I, mm. I think if you're looking at further studies that you would be able to be taking this into the future, then you might ask the kinds of questions about um, what is the expected product in a sociological political context of a doctrine? What do we expect doctor, uh, products to do sociologically? Mm. Because Jonathan Jansen, for example, in the South African context, but we're not just talking about the output products of PhDs, but we're also talking about the worthwhileness, its contribution, yeah. its sociological engagement with the field its contribution to the development of the society. So it has socio-political economic dimensions as well. So I, I'm just saying that there's another set of constellations to use your language uh, yeah. that might 
uh, uh, cluster around the, not the notions of, of the, the products as well. And they are mm. connected with the notions of the kind of um, developing sense of identity or what it means to be a doctorate, especially if you represent one, in, uh, one person out of 27 million in the country. So you mm. can see that's the product uh, that we need to be acknowledging that an individual doctor to such a rare commodity in the South African context mm. and its contribution and the personhood of that individual in a society has extremely important issues, which of course leads to the massification debate, but that's another debate mm. altogether. Oh, sure. But I, I think <laughs> yeah. you would be useful to think about possibility for a study that draws on a constellation around the notion about what is the worthwhile product of a doctoral uh, thesis or doctoral study. So that just... Uh, yeah, no, thank you. That's thank a good you. note, actually, because yeah. the, the whole, you know, numbers game definitely gets in the way of that. Um, and we start just, yeah, focusing quite narrowly on the notion of product, product rather than, as Jonathan argues, on the wider public good, perhaps, type ideas of why we and, do this. And that we've seen me, and that we've seen, <laughs> and that we've seen many people passing through with the so-called title and honorific of a doctor, but not necessarily the necessary attributes that uh, one yes. is expecting a doctor should be able to contribute to the wider society. And it's, yeah. it's almost as if the personal good overtakes the public good of why we in education and higher education uh, enterprise anyway. And I don't like the word enterprise, but uh, why are we engaging in as a, as a form of study anyway? Uh, right. I think that is an interesting debate that has economic uh, debates, which the NRF is being challenged about. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think Thank you. No, lots, lots of work study, to do. I, I hear <laughs> that it is no, we have a few papers in the pipeline. Will that's we need some time? That's an excellent point. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. A, that's a really great point. We're going to have to um, um, uh, wind this up. Like this is um, something that could uh, obviously lead to quite a lot of more discussion. Um, uh, and uh, does anybody have a quick um, a quick question or a quick comment? Um, I will. Oh, your uh, comments about the four K model, Carl. We'll talk yeah. about that. Thank you. Yeah, blow your mind. Yeah. The, the four competences are just the four Ks. There are the four Ks as a focus. So. Yeah. Oh, it is one paper. We don't have loads. No, no, of no. Space, I'm just saying we'll that. We'll see I'm what just, we can do. <laughs> you, I, I don't think anyone's suggestions have been about what to put in a paper. I no, think people's no, no, suggestions and comments have been about the research, which is not the paper. Yes, no, so, exactly. Um, no, we have like so three example, papers that we have example, the four, here, so. That would just give uh, another connection to think about how it relates across to, you know, um, uh, those four those four aspects of um, knowledge and knowing and knowers and, and, so, and so on. Um, Maybe that can be a fourth paper. <laughs> which is, uh, well, not really, it's just a small point, but it's just, it does track across. No, thank you. Does anybody have a quick um, quick comment or something before we uh, before we uh, zip off? Because I know a lot of people had to have that. Ah, yes, great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, thanks, Sharon. I read that. That was great. Hi. Um, so I, I hope it's a quick question. It's not properly formulated in my head. Um, I'm thinking about, because you're specifically looking at the axiological aspects of doctorateness, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about like, usually people tend to, to kind of classify a discipline as, you know, being stronger epistemic or so, stronger social or perhaps both. But it seems to me that what you're saying, because obviously this will apply to a lot of different disciplines that you're looking at, it's almost like there are, are different, there might be strong epistemic relations in the discipline that the student, the doctoral student is working with, but at the same time, strong axiological aspects 
um, in becoming the doctor, you know, um, developing that kind of identity. So it's almost like there's different levels at which this is, is working at at the same time. Does that make sense? <laughs> Potentially, yes. Because what's interesting is we're reading papers about the sciences and the humanities, not just about one mm -hmm. set of disciplines. And these same kinds of behaviors and dispositions come up over and over again in different ways in relation to different, I mean, the dispositions maybe are the same, but they come up in relation to different actions and behaviors that are perhaps informed more by the disciplinary knowledge. But ultimately, there does seem to be this particular set of dispositions that while they may be enacted in relation to different behaviors and concrete actions in terms of the writing and doing the research are valued in terms of being able to say, yes, this is a successful graduate. This is, this is a doctor. So, I mean, but we're still reading and we're still thinking and we're still debating the data because I see things Martina doesn't see and she sees things I don't see. And so we're still in that process of backwards and forwards sort of talk, thinking about what it is we're actually looking at. But um, we got to a point where we were stuck. So we thought the round table would be really good at getting us unstuck and it is. So thank you all very much for your feedback. This is fantastic. We now have a whole lot of more things to go and think about and talk about and write about. So, and we really, 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 really want to just get this paper done now because it's gone on for far too long. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, we should uh, call it to a uh, close now. Will so, we? yeah, uh, Steve's made a really good point in the chat, but the, Mauricio will be saving the chat and then sending it Oh, thank it you. Yes. You. I was going to ask that. We'd, yeah. love, yes, we'd love to see the chat. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, at some point in the future, we upload this to YouTube. So, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, the presenters, both of them, for. Thanks, um, everyone. For, uh, for their paper and uh, everyone who contributed and uh, by being here or asking a question or making a comment or whatever. So thank you very much everybody for being here. It's a great international community and I hope that you can feel that you can join in and, and um, don't worry, there's no such thing as a stupid question at all, um, ever. So thank you to everybody and thank you to uh, Sharon and Martina and I hope to see you here next week for LCT Vits doing uh, a really fascinating uh, round table next, uh, next week. So thank you everybody. Thank you everyone. See you next week. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye. <laughs>